my name is Dr. Hany Atal. I'm the Chief of Emergency Medicine at the Grady Hill System and an Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine at Emory University. Uh, I'd like to thank the judges for selecting us as one of the finalists, and uh, it's an honor to be here. We're going to be discussing how we uh, did modeling and optimizing emergency department workflow. I'm going to do the medical part, and uh, Dr. Lee's going to do the technical part. So what are some of the challenges of emergency departments on a whole throughout the country? Uh, very well documented overcrowding and growing volume, unnecessarily long length of stay and long wait times, which in, on occasion can lead to poorer outcomes. Presence of patients with non-urgent medical conditions utilizing emergency department to the tune of about 40% of the national ED visits. Returns after 72 hours on the national level are at 5% and at 30 days are at about 20% decreased quality of care patient satisfaction, and then sh shrinking rates of uh, reimbursement from Medicare and Medicaid as well as commercial insurers. Um, and then also the federal and state regulations, increased penalties on hospital meant to drive down health care costs. So our specific emergency department challenges, uh, a little bit about us, we're the premier level one trauma center for the region. Uh, we're internationally recognized teaching hospital for both Emory and Morehouse School of Medicine. We have about 120,000 ED visits per year. And this is, uh, we're on track this year for about 130,000. We have about 3,500 acute trauma patient admissions, which are trauma patients who stay in the hospital for longer than 24 hours. And we see about, on the average, 350 patients daily. Uh, the Monday after Labor Day, we saw 419 in one day, which was the highest we've had. We're very clearly a safety net hospital. Um, we only have 8% privately insured patients. 36% Medicare, Medicaid, and then 55% self-pay patients. On the national level, to give you a comparison, uh, emergency departments on the whole have about 50% insured patients. We have growing ED demand, and most significantly, we have limited health care access for the un- and underinsured to primary care, which drives up ED visits, which drives up costs. So just a little bit of background. We utilize the Emergency Severity Index as our triage tool. Uh, what this does is it gives you based on the nurse's uh, evaluation, a level of a patient acuity ranging from one to five, with one obviously being the most emergent. So those are the heart attacks, the strokes, the gunshot wounds to the chest, to level five, uh, which are people there who maybe come for a note for work or a medication refill. We have our blue zone, which is a major medical area. So that's our medical area, which is higher acuity medical patients. Red zone sees the lower acuity patients, including mental health patients there for medical clearance. PACE is our fast track area, again, minor complaints. And then we have a detention treatment area where we treat both local, county, and federal prisoners. And we have a trauma treatment area as well. So to clarify some of the definitions, length of stay is the time from when a patient arrives to the ED to the time when he or she departs from the ED. So to be very clear, it's not the time when they were first initially contacted by a provider, but it's the moment they walk into the door and are registered into the electronic tracking system, that's their arrival time. Their, the end of the length of stay is their departure time. So to be clear, again, that's not the disposition of the patient where the physician decides if the patient's being admitted or discharged. That's the time that the patient physically leaves the department. An avoidable revisit is a revisit resulting from an adverse event that occurred during the initial visit or from inappropriate care coordination following discharge. So a major burden to the U.S. health care system, over $20 billion in Medicare spending in 2005, and penalties put in place as part of the Affordable Care Act to meant to try and drive down these costs. Left without being seen is, again, a patient who arrives in the department believes before being seen by a qualified medical provider. So a qualified medical provider in our system is not a nurse, it's either a physician, a physician assistant, or a nurse practitioner. So what sets our hospital apart? We have a remarkable scope of services. We're the region's largest level one trauma center. We have the nation's largest hospital-based 911 ambulance service. And we're a regional coordinating hospital for all disasters, natural or man-made, in addition to all the other things we have up here. Uh, we are a safety net hospital. Um, all these sort of local or regional disasters uh, brought our hospital to the forefront. One certainly worth mentioning is the fact that it's the designated hospital for visiting dignitaries, including the President of the United States. So whenever they're in town, either the President or the First Lady, uh, we usually have a visit from the Secret Service. And for the duration of their visit, there's a Secret Service agent in our emergency department just in case. So we'll talk a little bit about our annual revenue and expenses. The pie chart at the top uh, looks at where our revenue sources come from. At the bottom, um, 
the very bottom down here, uh, the bars are uh, the Fulton County and DeKalb County support for the health system. As you can see, that's relatively flat compared to the expenses, which is the top line, which obviously have been increasing over time. Uh, on the expense side of things, salaries and benefits obviously make up the majority of our expenses, and then about an even match between the medical schools, which provide the physicians to staff the hospital, uh, as well as purchase services and other things there account for 15% as you see them broken down. So an annual economic impact on the health system to the community is, is significant. Uh, it's in, in the tune of $1.5 billion, um, 5,000 plus employees, and then all in all, it uh, creates or supports over 12,000 area, area jobs as well. The Georgia Tech and Grady collaboration has a long history. Uh, we have worked together in the past on quality improvement projects. In 2008, our senior VP at the, si at the time signed a, uh, to become a leader in the National Science Foundation Center for Health Organization uh, uh, Transformation. Uh, we did this, and since then we've been able to do rapid development and tests of change. The patients demand the change. The economic climate demands the change. And the U.S. healthcare industry, and us in particular, realize we're behind industry when it comes to process improvement and change management. That leads to increased costs, and our collaboration has sought to take that from the industry uh, to the healthcare fields. So one of, some of our goals uh, in terms of this collaboration were to improve ED patient flow and reduce length of stay. As you can see, it's uh, steadily decreased over the last eight years. We want to reduce left without being seen and increase throughput, reduce non-value added activities and reduce waste. Uh, we want to reduce and redirect some of those non-urgent patients to a more cost-effective and care-appropriate level of care. Uh, we want to analyze and predict revisit patterns and intervene to improve care. We've been able to reduce revisits by about 25%, and we want to improve quality care and patient satisfaction, which are directly related to dollars for the hospital and the current healthcare environment. So our benefits to patients and what we've been able to accomplish between 2008 and now was to reduce length of stay by 30%, and part of that was also to reduce the wait time and significantly reduce left without being seen, improve throughput, and then reduce the non-urgent admissions. We did all these things without any financial investment or labor uh, in addition. And then we repurposed existing resources into a clinical decision unit or observation unit to both reduce readmissions to the hospital, which currently carry a penalty, and to treat patients in a more appropriate, cost-effective environment. Um, some of our improvements have required sponsorships and donations, which have permitted additional ED activities. We've opened an alternative care facility with a new business model to treat lower acuity patients, and we expanded our trauma care, which is one of the signature uh, service lines of the hospital for, in the emergency department from four beds to 15 beds and increased trauma throughput by threefold. So how does this translate into actual improvements in the numbers? Uh, on this graph, you see the uh, different treatment areas. Uh, so there's blue, red, and PACE, which are sort of our main treatment areas, the trauma treatment area, and then the detention treatment area where we treat people in the penal system. And you can see that all of them have, have, have had sustained decreases um, in their length of stay. In addition, when we look at the uh, revisits, both the 72-hour as well as 30-day revisits, we've had decreases in the... Um, in the uh, revisits, uh, both at 72 hours and uh, 30 days, for patients who are of higher acuity. The lower acuity patients, we haven't had, had so much of an impact, and these really are the patients who are using the healthcare system for their primary care. So they may be there because they have a cough, cold, or runny nose. We haven't focused a lot of our energy on those patients at the moment, but we are actually getting ready to kick something off uh, to help um, treat them in a more cost-effective environment as well. So we will detail the methodology, but the, in, in terms of the really advances in the OR, they are in three multiple fronts. And first is that we combine the agent-based optimization, agent-based simulation and optimization into one unified scheme. And that within that, we actually do multiple resource allocation, where it includes human resource, beds, equipment, and everything. Within that simulation, we simulate and optimize so that we can actually achieve the results. Also, we use the machine learning approach uh, 
and develop a new model where we can actually identify the characteristics of really predicting why patients come back. Those characteristics will allow individuals to actually be modeled within the simulation system as well as being able to intervene and actually pull them out in, after they get treatment and into the observation unit. And that becomes really important. And there we have the theoretical results as well as computational advances. And more important is that as we see the computation effort is really large, is that we want to be able to really not only to simulate the operations, but the human behavior, the treatment behavior, all into one single platform that can handle all the big data. And this is really the first model across the OR community as well as the clinical community where we are able to use all the data that is available and study all these characteristics in one single system. So clearly, nobody say this is easy because clearly it is is difficult, but we would like to know if we push this envelope, how far can we go? So this is a schematic um, picture of this study. We see multiple stakeholders here, patients, providers, and every one of them is being simulated. And also the process outside the ED units are also being simulated because when you actually discharge the patients, they go to different places and you need to have those interdependency. The data we have been blasted that Grady actually has the electronic medical record. We have really access to hundreds of thousands of uh, records of patient information. And also uh, we supplement that with time motion studies so that we understand the service time better. And we also have historical data on the, all the laboratory tests and everything. Then through this information, we feed it into the predictive analytic framework, the machine learning framework that we built and developed and trying to understand the characteristics. And these serve as two purposes input into the simulation and optimization system as well as really intervention of selecting which patient to actually put into the observation units. And we observe all these interdependency and build the models and then fit everything into the system. Before we can optimize, we must validate that the model itself actually really describe the current system really well. And once we got the recommendations, we really prioritize that and feed it back to the clinical leaders, and there's uh, many loops going through that. For this particular talk, I'm going to talk about two phases of uh, advances, because this is multi-years work, and I would like to show you how that actually happens and whether we get good results or not. So the data, I cannot give you all the information if like some of the students, that some of my students here know that um, it's a lot of data and, and very uh, intensive data analysis has to be performed. So basically we need to know the arrival rate of different type of class of patients and how do they arrive, whether by the ambulance or walk in. And we also have the service time for all these different um, categories of services as well as the laboratory information, as well as how many times each individual actually use this lab test and so that we can actually classify them and also the bed assignment and everything. We also have the, uh, at any single time, we also know how busy the hospitals are. That means how many beds are occupied, how many people are on the, on the ground. A very interesting uh, data for us to look at and also very complex for us to analyze and be able to input them. Using this data, the amount of data is between 300 data points to about 500,000 data points and uneven across because some of the time motion study that we have, we got about 300 data points to supplement the existing data. So this is the first part of the advances is the machine learning framework. This is really um, makes integer programming approach where the J entity, now I'm going to talk precisely just in the medical term, but this model clearly is not just designed for uh, medicine. It said we have the J entity from group G classified back to group G. That means this is the correct classification. So we want to maximize the correct classification and it's subject to the limitation on how many errors you are going to compete and commit. And then there is the, this is the nonlinear transformation where we transform the attributes. That means this could be lab tests and different type of characteristics of patients from the attribute space, which is 100,000 
down to the group space, which could just be like from two all the way to how many groups that you are looking at. And then you try to solve these problems. How hard are these problems? When I first uh, established this model, and as some of you die hard optimizers, you have the big M and, and small little epsilon. So I actually gave this to Bixby, one of the small instances, and he instantly got really upset with me because CPLEX returned a solution for the linear programming relaxation, which is infeasible. So partly because the problem itself, this is a very little number, and you have to have the equality sign. And then he said, where did you get these nasty problems? It's very interesting is that Bob is an expert in optimization. So it's good to make him really excited and angry at the same time. So, And I, I guess I am fortunate to be able to talk to him in that level, since he was my advisor. So I, then what we do is that we work really hard to figure out what are the characteristics of this problem. Interesting enough is that this really is motivated really by medical applications is that this is the first computational model in the field of support vector machine that is really suitable for any number of groups. So instead of just two groups of three groups, we actually were able to really develop that. And then we have a nonlinear transformation where it transforms the attribute space to the group space. That means very low dimension, like from high dimension to low dimension. And we constrain the misclassification. We have a reserve judgment where it can handle the fussy patients. That means you can actually do multi-group, multi-stage analysis. And it can handle many different type of attributes. So it is really quite exciting for us. Theoretically, this actually proved to be NP complete. We proved that, and for group that is greater than or equal to three, it's, it's basically NP complete. For two groups, you can actually solve it in polynomial time. We also proved that the solution space is beautiful. It's that it is universally strongly um, consistent. That means no matter what probability distribution you have across the groups, it actually optimizes to the base optimal solution. It converges to the base optimal solution. This is the nicest property that you can have for a classifier. So that's a, a, actually really nice. And then, of course, it has some other properties. I wasn't able to really figure out, like the doctors, like Dr. Atali, and everyone would always ask me, like, why is it working so well and whatever. I said, you know, it really takes me a while to figure out why, because it is easy to, it's not easy to come up with a solution, but even coming up with a solution and try to explain why does it work, it, it really is not so easy to explain. But we are very happy that it actually works really well, especially with data that have very uneven groups. So how do we compare to other classifiers? So we look at some of the state-of-the-art support vector machines. And basically, across this training set of 15,000 patients, about 14,500 of them are non-return patients and 500 of them are return patients. Most of the classifier basically sacrifice everything of the return patients because it's very unbalanced, right? 14,500 versus 500. They figure, if I can figure out 14,500, I'm very correct already, but if you split it into the group itself, that is not the case. And so we are pretty happy, like with the 72 hours, we actually get a really nice result. And, and in the medical term, this is really good because um, this is a combination result, including all the patients that come as a primary care. So then getting arming with this information, knowing all the characteristics that are important. Now our little agent inside the simulation will have a little behavior exactly like the patients, how do they behave, what type of complaints they have, how does the pay provider seeing them would actually treat them. Then we feed all this information into the simulator, and the optimization within that is a nonlinear uh, mixed integer program where we try to optimize the type of workers that are available and also the type of equipment, the bed, and, and all this. And with the really restrictions on how long will you allow them to wait, how big are the queues, and for those of you that have gone to Grady or public hospital, you know that the queue is always bigger than the size of the room that is available. So it is important to really fit those into the constraint. And also, we also constrain the how long do you allow them to stay. That means that is the length of stay. So that's like, in some sense, is really fitting into the model of what they would like to drive the length of stay to as slow as possible. So we build this system, and then the nonlinear optimization is being kickstart with a fluid model, finding the uh, really feasible solution, finding an, an estimate, good estimate, and then as we simulate, we actually improve the solution using local search, and it, we incorporate everything into the simulation. 
environment. And I apologize, this is a very tiny part of the model. I, I wasn't able to actually build, like I show you the entire model. It said this is the simplified version so that it will fit into the PowerPoint. It basically describes how an individual comes in at the ambulance and walk in, they go through the blue zone, red zone, and then the trauma case, and then they get through, and then they uh, being disposed at this, this, no, not disposed, yeah, disposition. Although it is interesting because, like in in our case, we say we dispose them. That means they get out of the system, right? So the sister independency. I want to show you this one. It's really important. Is that um, basically when patient is being discharged. They actually could be sent home, which is good, or they will be sent to ICU or to other units in the hospital. So those places may not have the bed and they may have to wait. So those are all being modeled also. So we have those information in the system. So this is really the first simulation model really that incorporate all the uh, interdependency inside and outside that connects to the ED as well as being able to optimize the entire system. So to give you an idea, this is a really difficult part is that how well can we actually really model the current operations? And I think like actually I have some of the students that actually went to the hospital and they will know it's a pretty painful process but we must go through this process to know if we simulate the right model or not right so we are very fortunate is that this is the in phase one we use six months to to us uh, really study it and learn in the model and then we actually blind predict the operations in the next three months and this is the predictive risk predicted uh, values from the simulation system and this is the actual values. So we are pretty close to the system and in the same way in phase two we also look at that and phase two started uh, basically um, in December, October to December 2010 we started the collecting data for phase two. So in the prediction here I think it is very interesting in terms of the if you look at level one patient we can predict very accurately when they will return is that because these patients are definitive they're not coming here get acute care if they're not really sick and you also notice that the patients that are insured also we can predict very well because they also use the hospitals really that's unavoidable and so in that sense is that uh, you look at patients that are uninsured they use it as primary care then it is difficult to predict why they come back because they come back and they they have certain illness that they want to be seen by the doctor this is this this is a very interesting chart for us to understand in terms of the prediction really is correlated to the type of payers and also the type of level of care. So phase one recommendation, understanding that we are really close to the operations and now we feel that we are comfortable with doing the systems optimization. So the solution returned from the system is this one, is a global solution. And with the understanding the hospital likes to really do things in a phase out manner and also wanting to know what affects which one. So we split the solution into four components and into actually really nice components. So this is related to consolidation of processes. This is the lab return, turnaround, rapid lab return. This is optimizing the resources for the acute level and then this is for the low acuity level. And basically the last option, I separate that because it required them to really combine red and blue zone. So red and blue zone basically at the moment is really in the old days, they separated in color, trying to separate the patients that are acute versus the patients that are non-urgent. That was before the ESI was established. Now this is only physically, you see red and blue. It really doesn't have uh, as much meaningful thing to it. So we try to really convert, like convince the hospital to change that. So you can see from our simulated results, we expect we will have about really three hours, at least three hours length of stay uh, decrease and then the wait time also decreased by a lot, by three hours. So let's look at the implementation. So among the implementation, in addition to those that come out from the uh, system itself, we also have the eliminating batch process and also uh, recommending this actually come out Option nine actually comes out from the optimization system. Is that recommending having an observation unit pull out those patients that may come back and actually observe them and wait longer so that we can actually reduce the return rate. And then option 10 is to recommend that walk-in patients, direct them to alternative care. So the implementation, I, I think I have to say I was at the IOM meeting um, just three weeks ago. Every hospital say change is impossible and there is some truth there because 
in hospital, you change anything, it affects the patient right away. So I have been very fortunate is that we got the buy-in, like of course with all the uh, long-term collaborations as well as every, every level of players that is involved in it. We got the buy-in from the uh, senior people as well as the nurses on the ground and were able to make them really um, implement the change and make it happen. So these are some of the results. So we are quite excited seeing the results because as you know, this is that we don't get an really instant feedback right away, right? Because we have to wait for them to tell us at the end of the month what exactly the output is. So all this table that I'm showing you, and I apologize, lots of numbers, and is that these tables are all the average of a one month value. So there will be different ranges. And basically you see that we achieve the really what we wanted the three hours uh, reduction. And then we can see that in some of the acuity level high, we can actually achieve really well. And I must mention for trauma patient, even 10 minutes reduction could mean life and death. And Grady is well known for the level one uh, trauma care. That's a really, really important for them. So we have been very fortunate seeing this result. And for these options, the observation unit is established. And that means we keep the patient a little longer. So you would expect the length of stay to be slightly longer because uh, we don't let them go, right, some of those patients. And then this one is the alternative care. So the interesting part about Grady is that as Grady becomes more efficient, and the patients realize that and they are more demand. Okay? And these are not patients that are not sick. These are really patients that require care. And their, their ED um, really demand really rises. And we saw that and it is unbelievable. And so it's as if they really realize now they can get good care and they actually go there and have the, the uh, care. So in this graph, the blue lines correspond to the 72 hours return. So remember at the beginning, we want a reduction of 25%. We actually achieved more than that. It's about 28%. And especially for acuity level, really uh, level one patients. And then you see the 30 day really um, return is also lower. So I must mention that Affordable Care Act put penalty in these return patients. That means not only Grady will not get a payment, they also have to pay a fine if these patients come back. So this is really important, not just for the patient, but for the financial healthiness of the hospital. In the phase two, since I don't have a lot of time and, and I want to make sure that I want to be able to show you what's happening as the, um, really the throughput increases, like, and, and the demand also increase in terms of the patients coming in. So we embark another level, basically repeat the same process. And that knowing that some of those consolidation have already implemented and in, in, in the modeling, we actually uh, really change those and then see what's happening. Here again, the implementation. Do you see it's funny? Phase one, we ask them to change the blue and red. Phase two, ask them to do it one more time. So in fact, this is really interesting. It is true across almost all the hospitals, even though their colors are different. I mean, in some of the hospitals. So I thought it is interesting because that is a very unified uh, theme there. And so we again achieve a very nice uh, reduction. Now you notice that the we don't really see the 72 hours return to be different. Part of the reason is that at that time, they implemented seven units of the um, observation unit, uh, seven, seven rooms for that. And now dem demand on the rise. So they no longer have extra room to actually pull in these patients. So they are still operating at the same level for the revisit patients. So what happened then is that um, Grady actually just last month opened up T from seven units to 20 units. So they realized they really need that because the gain is substantial. So over the last five years, this is the really improvement you see is that uh, each of these bar represent the periods of change that is being made. And so overall, we see a reduction of like about three hours or 30% 30, 30 of reduction in length of stay. But if you stare at the most acute one, the blue and red one, even the PACE patient, is that you see 50% reduction in the length of stay. So that is really very critical. The trauma care reduced by 18% and the detention, these are the prisoners, and they are reduced by 36%. And this has implication, and Salua is not here. I have, I have students that we actually deal with some of these uh, prisoners, like they have the place, is that understanding these prisoners cannot be outside the prison for too long, right? Reducing their time of treatment is actually really good for the patient as well as for the um, officer that is in charge of them. 
So this is the length of stay, and the, the, this is the return for the uh, 72 hours and 30 hours. So we see a very nice uh, also changes. Again, I must mention level five patients. These are the patients that come in and see if they have headache or if they, they have actually really very little things, they just come in. And because that is primary care that they serve as. So, so what this meant to us, significant benefits within the system. Uh, reduced length of stay, reduced wait time, reduced revisits, reduced left without being seen, and then timeliness of care, which is directly related to saving of lives. So patients who come in with acute strokes, you are very time limited in, in terms of what you can do. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, interventional coverage to be able to treat stroke patients as well as trauma patients as well. So trauma surgeons and all that is, is available 24 hours a day. Being able to get to the patient sooner means better outcome, less mortality, but also less prolonged illness because of the injuries that they had. Efficiency and effectiveness, we've increased uh, ED throughput by 19%, and we've also reduced or redirected the non-urgent patients by 32%. Our goal is that over time, the patients will understand that every time they go to the emergency department, they're sent to this, sort, uh, this lower acuity area, and so they'll start to self-select and go to that lower acuity area by themselves. This new business for alternative care is what we've designed to help deal with those lower acuity patients, and we've been able to expand our trauma care and increase throughput. So. In trauma care, we often refer to the golden hour. So from the time of injury to the time you have definitive treatment should be within 60 minutes. If, you've been, if we've been able to reduce um, the treatment time by 90 minutes, that again translates directly to lives and in, in improve patient outcomes as well. In addition, and very important to us, was that these uh, improvements were sustained over time. So what does it mean to us financially? And again, it's very important to us because we have limited funding resources. We have a lot of, quite honestly, non-paying or underpaying patients. So every dollar we get allows us to offer more services to the patients who probably need it the most. We've increased throughput, uh, which, and these are annual numbers, $41.8 million effect, reduced revisits by $7.5 million, plus there's more of an effect on that based on reduced mor morbidity for those patients as well. Uh, new business for this non-urgent alternative care area, $4.6 million. We've expanded our trauma program, which is one of our signature service lines, to the tune of about $9.1 million. And then the timeliness of care has helped reduce disability and improve outcomes. So this is tens to hundreds of millions of dollars because that person who had a stroke, we were able to get to very quickly. And now, instead of being bed-bound, they're able to continue working throughout the rest of their life and supporting their family. So how do we make it work? And this is the challenge for us. Uh, we have a lot of people who work in the hospital, uh, and trying to keep them all on the same page is very difficult. The one uh, common theme we have is the only constant we have is change. So from year to year, there's significant change. The driving force to continue the change is to remain in that safety net role for the patients in the community and to one day become the premier public hospital in the United States. Um, <clears throat> So continue challenges, these are our volumes over the last three years. You can see as they continue to rise, in January we saw 11, over 11,000 patients. Uh, we're undergoing a facility layout redesign to combine the red and blue zones uh, to the tune of about $50 million approved by our board, our board of directors. And our next project is to work on those super utilizers to try and get them to self-select and go directly to those uh, non-urgent non care areas. So I am going to summarize again in the OR advances. I think this is an exciting project because it has multiple fronts in terms of what we can actually handle that. So we optimize within simulation. Instead of doing scenario-based analysis, we really, and this simulation has agent-based as well as discrete event simulation. And we also really established the machine learning framework where we can prove some very nice theoretical results as well as advance the computational part so that we can actually incorporate all this complex data. And we also integrate all of this information together so that you can actually optimize over the operations, the system dynamics, the characteristics of patient providers, as well as really how does people actually behave and also the interdependency of all the processes. So the challenge here really are computation and mathematics. And I would say that it is really quite important in terms of like being able to have a big team of people working with us and be able to validate our findings. What have we done using those techniques is that um, 
we can actually apply the same technology to ICU, the OR, hospital acquired condition, and surgical site infections. We got really exciting results. Grady is involved in some of these projects. And also this technology has been applied to some other EDs and, and with really great successes. They are all different. Every hospital chief, the first time I visit the hospital, they like to remind me, Eva, we are different. And I say, I know, because every hospital told me the same thing. And they, they are right. Sometimes it's interesting. I don't know. I have seen hundreds of hospitals, and every one of them seems to be quite different indeed. But I think if you talk about change, that's even, they have one common thing is that nobody seems to be able to change in which direction that they want. So we generalize those technology also is that um, the police department has noticed this work, and so we are using that for the security and crowd control with the police department. I have 200 students working on it, so if you ask the students, some of them tell you, this is so hard, I don't know how we can ever finish the projects. Or some of them say, this is really exciting, I've never thought of, like, we can actually work with the police department, and it's so cool. So I think it is an interesting part of it. So the team I cannot thank enough people. You can see that we have the medical chiefs, we have the nurse, and then we have the executive senior vice president that is on board, and we have all the nurses on the ground that help us. And then I have the team of students at Georgia Tech that help us with all these um, data collection as well as modeling and computation and theoretical advances. Thank you.